So maybe we can just start in, and Wayne actually will ask us questions. But um, thank you so much, everybody, for joining in. And I know everyone's busy taking care of many facets of life these days in different ways than we have in the past. And um, maybe we can just do a check-in about what's happening. I know each of our regions is different in terms of the impact of COVID, how we've uh, handled it, what's happening right now. We, we were hit extremely hard in, in Europe, as you know, uh, after Italy, uh, we were the, the hardest hit it uh, by COVID-19. So basically in March 13th, uh, the government decided to lock down the whole country. So that, that, that implied that our research center by law had to be locked down. So, you know, from one day basically to the other, we couldn't go in anymore and we had to cancel all the visits that were programmed for the upcoming weeks. Um, so Wayne, so you have an idea, our research center is basically uh, focused on the prevention of Alzheimer's disease. So all our research is with people that are cognitively unimpaired that may have an increased risk for Alzheimer's for different reasons, family history, uh, genetics, etc. So we perform all kinds of studies. Some of them are observational. Uh, we have a, a large study, which is called the Alpha Plus, which is an observational study in which we do all kinds of biomarker studies on, on a cognitively unimpaired population. Uh, and it's longitudinal. And we also have trials and interventional studies, even a multimodal study uh, using uh, uh, physical exercise and cognition to try to improve uh, uh, or delay cognitive uh, impairment. So that was heavily impacted. So we obviously had to make different decisions uh, depending on the type of study. And some of them uh, were depending on the sponsor, like some trials. But the other thing that we were at least lucky enough to be able to organize right away is that we already had gather quite a lot of data from our alpha class study that we were uh, ready to analyze. So we set uh, virtually all the data. It was already virtual. So what we set is all the researchers from the team uh, around like uh, 12 to 15 people uh, were, are working from home. They are analy analyzing the data and we are getting some results. And, and obviously after this period, there will be some papers coming out. So at least uh, we keep on moving uh, the study forward through analyzing and publishing some data. So there'll be academic children born. Exactly. <laughs> that's, a, that's, a, that's a good idea. I like that. <laughs> That's good. I like that. That's good, Steve. <laughs> yeah, that's now, good now, you told me, Jose, that a while back, you, could, you couldn't go outside to exercise. And that's right. I mean, we have been allowed to start exercising outside Saturday, this oh, past yeah. Saturday. So we've been several weeks, uh, literally completely locked down at home. And I'm quite privileged because I have a patio. It's a big place. So we can do all sorts of things. But I, you know, if you think about the people that live in a small apartment, right. uh, being like seven weeks without being able to go out, just being able to go out to shop uh, and things like that, um, it was, you know, really, really complex for many people. Other things that we are doing, obviously, we are calling the participants from the study uh, for two different reasons. One, to check up on them, how they are doing, how they are feeling, if they have got sick uh, by COVID-19. Uh, then we are doing some additional studies to see the impact of COVID-19 on, on, on emotions and things like that. Um, and finally, we are very interested to sense how they feel uh, to come back, uh, mm. how they perceive coming back into the research center to keep doing the, the studies that we were doing that require to be there face to face because uh, some of the studies include MRI, uh, amyloid imaging, which is PET imaging, uh, CSF sampling, blood sampling. So obviously they have to come in. And what I can tell you is right now we sense some reluctancy. Uh, we sense there is certain degree of fear. Uh, and they say, basically what, what they tell us is, okay, let's see what the government say. And from there, we'll see how things go. So they are not telling us, yeah, yeah, we'll happily go back whenever it's safe. The answer is much more cautious. So um, I'm a little bit concerned about the impact, long-term impact that COVID-19 may have on our studies 
not just because of this two, three months period of, of being locked down, but the reluctancy of people to come back for the longitudinal assessments, which is sensible. We have to respect and safety obviously come first. These are completely healthy people. So uh, something to keep in mind on our side. Wayne, did you have a question? There's a possibility, obviously, of a second surge and, you know, this great uncertainty going forward here. We can't predict the future here in the States, over in Spain, or really anywhere. So that, that complicates the picture too, I would think. Yes, Jose? Yes, definitely. Uh, so what we are thinking is we, we, whenever by law we are allowed to start visiting our participants, our idea is call them again, see how they feel, have all kind of safety measures in place, uh, which we will tell them up front uh, as soon as they come into the building. And this is a research building, so it's not linked to a hospital, which is good mm. because uh, the risk of infection probably is not as high as if it was located in a hospital. So that's on one side, but as soon as they come in or even before they come in, we will offer them masks, gloves, and all the personnel will be with masks, gloves, etc. Uh, to decrease the minimum, the potential risk, and we will decrease the amount of personnel in the building as well. So one of the things that we are starting to consider, and I'm going to try to push somehow, uh, we have realized that many of the researchers can work uh, safely from home, analyze, analyzing the data, we can have virtual meetings, we can discuss the data, so they don't have to be physically there. So we probably will delay and the coming back of those people that can work safely and efficiently from home uh, until the last moment. So the number of people in the building will be the minimum as possible. So um, thanks. Uh, hi, everybody. Uh, I think uh, for 90%, you can copy paste the Jose Luis story to mine, to ours in the Netherlands. Uh, we started a little bit later with the uh, lockdown. We have uh, called it a partial lockdown because we were allowed on the street to do groceries and um, had much more freedom than I think uh, Jose Luis had. Uh, we are actually uh, in uh, 50 minutes from now, um, I'm going to uh, sort of uh, check out because our prime minister will give a, a press conference about uh, releasing some of the uh, um, sort of measures that were taken. We are gradually um, loosening up uh, a little bit. And uh, to the effect um, of care, I'm responsible for all of the outpatient of neurology in the hospital. And we have started to upscale our activities as from mo Monday, last Monday. So we are uh, increasing uh, seeing patients physically uh, up to 25% of our, our prior uh, uh, sort of volume. And the rest we will do by telemedicine and video consult, etc. And today, May 6, uh, we have also tr started upscaling research, but we are sort of not noting um, exactly who has to come physically in for a visit for the observational studies that we are running, for the trials that we are running, for everything else. Uh, but that will be also not uh, to the full extent, and it will take many, many more months. Um, so, so basically, uh, I think, and, and the reason why we are loosening up is because after now for the last two, three weeks, actually, we see the amount of new cases, the amount of deaths, and especially, which is the limiting factor in the Netherlands has always been the amount of ICU beds. And they are now up to us to the level that is really acceptable. It has gone down tremendously so that we can actually sort of open the door a little bit. Uh, but of course, um, uh, everybody is very careful. Schools will start May 11, only the, the primary schools and not the secondary schools. They will off until the, uh, the new season in September. Uh, so there will still be a lot of limitations. Uh, public transport, transport is only possible with, uh, with mouth protection after June 1st. Flying is only possible in a limited uh, scale with, uh, with a... Um, uh, with the, the the protection as well, so it's 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 limited, but it's less limited than it was in Spain and Italy. And I think uh, we're in that sense we are sort of relatively lucky. How, how are you people, you personally, and and your colleagues on the front lines doing emotionally and in terms of your mental health? How how is that working out for you? It's a tremendous stress, and needless to say, 
Yeah, well, of course, neurologists are not on the front line uh, ever. In <laughs> fact, um, <clears throat> uh, so and I'm 62, so I'm a risk um, and, and male, so a risk category. So I didn't have to serve on the ICU, but many of the residents and actually many of my uh, physician researchers were called and did uh, sort of rounds on the ICU, <laughs> helping also on uh, COVID awards that are not on the ICU. Uh, so several of them were engaged. And I'm one of the senior persons actually in the staff. So I actually was in the hospital almost every day, uh, organizing everything and, and sort of uh, keeping, especially uh, motivating the, the, the non-medical staff also to be there in shifts, uh, to organize things, to telecode. We reorganized the whole outpatient clinic in order to um, facilitate all the telephone conference, telephone visits. And video visits um, and so so I was more on the organizational scale but up to your question I think many of my colleagues uh, were extremely supported by the, the Dutch people we had uh, several rounds of applause uh, publicly uh, even the king congratulated us he came to several hospitals so there is that's the good thing about this crisis there is an enormous uplift of the appreciation of healthcare workers in fact and and we can do very well with that Oscar, how about you? Yeah, so um, I guess uh, Sweden did a slightly different approach to, to many other countries. We have had yet no lockdown um, at all. Schools are open, restaurants are open, and so on. Uh, I'm, flying right over. Oscar, I'm, fly I'm getting on the next plane. I'll see you tomorrow. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, uh, I don't know uh, if you've seen pictures, people sitting at the restaurants, drinking coffee, yes, yes. having a beer, yeah, yeah, yeah. and yeah, so on. Yeah. Uh, yeah. But I, th I thought you were opposed to that, uh, sort of, basically. I, I was, uh, and uh, especially in the beginning, uh, I think it was like a gamble, but it turned out to work quite well. Uh, so, <laughs> of course, it's not like Sweden, they're not doing anything. So people try to keep a distance, of course, like everyone uh, in, in the world even though it's not really decided if it's one meter or two meters, no one really knows, but we should, should try to keep a distance. Yeah. They have been quite, they made a sharp line, a bit artificially of, of um, age of 70. So people above age of 70 have been strictly, that they should stay at home and not um, uh, get the, close to anyone, not even their children or grandchildren. So that mm. has been the Swedish approach. Uh, the rest of the people below 70, they should probably be able to deal with this, but if you're above 70, you should be very careful. That, that's with the mm. Swedish. Uh, uh, way and I, it has worked out quite well. I think Stockholm is the most hit city, but it's not much worse than I guess in, in Belgium uh, or you Netherlands or definitely not as in Italy and Spain. Here down is, in south of Sweden, nothing is happening. We have really transformed our uh, hospitals, increased the ICU. Uh, a lot of my research staff, uh, nurses and so on, are working in the hospital, but they have actually not much to do because the patients are not coming. Uh, so it's, we're really scaled up and just waiting, uh, but mm. not much is happening. We, of course, don't know if it will happen, but not no. yet uh, has anything happened. Um, how about, so, your how about your, the effect on your program? Yes. So... Uh, when it comes to our um, uh, observational uh, studies, we have kept on with I individuals that are below 70, but naturally most are above 70. Uh, but so we have not uh, uh, had any visits with, with those above 70. So that, that is a big problem. We have stopped uh, recruitments, of course, new recruitments, but the follow-up visits uh, have, have then had to be cancelled and postponed uh, to the autumn. Uh, we will have great problems. We already now anticipate that we have a backlog of 250 and 150 MRIs in August uh, mm -hmm. that we somehow need to, to solve at the same time as, as dealing with everything else in the, in the bottom. So, so for the observational studies, we will have uh, big problems. Yeah. Uh, but the treatment trials we have actually continued. So those we have not had an age limit because we thought it was important that people still get uh, the, 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 the therapies that they, uh, in the studies. So, so those have uh, continued uh, as uh, previous. Right. Uh, the lab, think lab has been open. So we are doing lab work and uh, so on, pipetting uh, different immunoassays and everything is up and running and it's been all the time. I think all the lab, uh, all, the, all the people working in basic science, the, all the labs were closed. Uh, I think that's also in the UK and in Germany, it was the case. And uh, I saw also our observational studies are also um, not ongoing, not only because people cannot enter the building and they are afraid to enter the building, just as Jose Luis said. So people are also, even if they are allowed to, they are a little bit afraid to come. But the biggest bottleneck is actually the imaging. 
Mm. Um, so MR and, and patent, uh, that sort of thing is a real bottleneck because uh, personnel is, it was already scarce and some of them got ill uh, and they are sort of gradually sort of uh, now unlocking the whole thing, but we have a backlog as well, especially mm. for MRI. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, so with us, um, there's a lot of overlap from what you guys said. Yeah. Um, we've been, our state, our uh, governor has been very hands-on, very involved in trying to manage this crisis, make sure we had enough PPE, had ICU beds. We built the, our convention centers, now set up as a thousand bed hospital, et cetera, et cetera. And uh, fortunately, we haven't needed it. Uh, in New York, they actually use some of these auxiliary hospitals, but we prepared for it. And so far, we haven't needed it, thank God. Um, mm -hmm. I would say it's been of moderate. I mean, for the people who passed away, it's not moderate. I think the worst thing has been when someone, and it's probably true in your, uh, your cities too, is when someone is ill in the hospital, the family cannot visit them. Yeah, and, definitely. And, and if someone's terribly ill, someone's hmm. terribly ill, and yeah. they usually can't visit either. Many people die alone, and that's been die alone. Yeah, that's, and the nursing homes have been closed as well uh, for visitors. Eh? So nobody could yes, visit their nursing mother home, or father. Yeah. Nursing homes very hard hit. My own mother is in a retirement community down in Florida, and I'm hmm. very nervous about it. So far, we that we know of, no patient, no residents have been affected, but some of the staff have been positive. So, I mean, it's obviously a very nervous time. Yes, uh, just to add, nursing homes have been heavily hit it, uh, right. in Spain, both in Barcelona and Madrid. Right. And so, yeah, uh, yeah. That's, that's been a major issue as well. Yeah, with us and, too. And, and now, uh, as you know, numbers are starting to come down, but still uh, there is a, a concern that things may not go as well as expected because people are exposing themselves heavily sure. now. I mean, we are right. supposed now, for example, to come out uh, in certain hours of the day. So mm -hmm. when I go for my run in the morning, because that's the time period uh, that people my age has, uh, I'm seeing people over 70, which are not supposed to be outside at oh, that I time. Um, and, and then, you know, kids can go out. And what families are not realizing is that uh, the kids cannot go and play together either. Because if one of them obviously right. is infected, it's going to infect the other and it's going to infect the other family. So uh, let's see what happens. I mean, it's, it's going to be the upcoming two, three weeks are going to be extremely important in Spain to see right. how. Yeah. Well, I think overall, we sort of have a bifurcation here because we have Brown University. So the, the laboratories are closed and people are discouraged from coming to work. Uh, over in the hospitals, the hospitals are open. And uh, so I've been coming to work, but half our staff has been coming to work every day and the other half has been working from home. Uh, we're hoping when the stay at home order is lifted, all of our staff will start coming back in. There's people are concerned about that. Some of our staff about, you know, like you were saying, Jose, about your participants, some of our staff are also concerned. And so we're gonna take, you know, extensive safety measures, you know, social distancing and masks and, and, and hygiene and so forth to try to, uh, you know, uh, protect uh, safety. Uh, we've been continuing our treatment trials and uh, most people have been coming in for those, but some people, some trials have offered an optional hiatus like the A4 trial and some people have taken advantage of that. So the study will be extended so that people get the same amount of treatment. Uh, the observational trials are on hold except for remote visits uh, by and large. And um, hopefully those are gonna, we're in negotiations now with our IRB to say, see when they're gonna start up. I'd like to see them start up soon. Uh, we've had to definitely delay. We have a number of new trials that are starting. Um, uh, major, we had a news conference, a press conference scheduled at our state house for a major trial for a lifestyle intervention. And we've had to delay that. And uh, hopefully that's going to start soon and, and a number of other major trials had to, you know, have been, put a, have been paused for longer than we would normally. So, so we're in the same, we're in a transition. 
Yeah, I mean, yeah. for me, one of the key things is how we are going to organize the future. Uh, right. Especially because, you know, Sweden has not changed that much. For them, it's more of a continuing. But for us, uh, I mean, when you have people that have been told by law, you have to stay home, stay home, stay home, then uh, the change is not going to be that easy. Uh, on top of that, we don't know when we are, I mean, unless we have a very effective uh, vaccine, uh, there's always going to be some risk. Uh, so how we are going to handle that, we discussed this a little bit previously, but that's going to be a, one of the big question marks. So, so yeah, great concern about how our future research is going to be impacted in the uh, long term, even medium term, medium term, long term. Uh, and we cannot answer that because we don't know how things are going to go. So that's that's one of the key things. Well, I think social, I think, I mean, I call this the new abnormal is, you know, <laughs> learning, learning how to manage, you know, create a safe and work environment with the virus still being present because the, as you say, we don't have a treatment and we don't have a vaccine. So we're, there's still the risk. And I think that's going to be the challenge. I think there's going to be a lot more remote assessment Oh, oh yes, yes. And remote and telemedicine. Yeah. Tell everything. Tell every. I mean, tell everything. <laughs> well, tell every, yeah. <laughs> for us, everything. it was a very. I think under under pressure, everything becomes fluid, isn't it? So we we tried to do telemedicine for ages already, but it was never the insurance. So the health insurance companies did never pay for it, and now all of a sudden, everything is possible. So it's yeah. now. It doesn't matter whether you see the patient physically or you phone them. You get the same. And for me, that's not interesting in academic hospital. For the hospital at large, it is. So suddenly, I mean, and I think I've discovered it as well. I think many of the return visits we will do by telephone also in the future. Uh, so that will decrease the amount of people actually entering the building and also traveling all over the country. I think it's great. And people like it, actually. Uh, I think we did a survey and 90% of the people is extremely happy with the service we offer just by tele the telephoning them or video conferencing. And I think that's, that's for the future. We'll stay. Hmm. I agree. Yeah, that's very good. I know because that... We, uh, we're going to research... do MRI, but uh, that will be the future. Sorry? MRI. We're going to do yeah, tele MRI. MRI. Tele MRI. Tele MRI. Tele lumbar puncture. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Wow. Yeah. yeah. Tele lumbar puncture. Well, the, the blood tests are, are handy. In there. Yeah, exactly. You can do it at home. You can do it at home. I mean, GP can come at home and do your amyloid, amyloid and tau test at home. Yeah. Yeah. The, the Swedish will do soon that. <laughs> yeah. Wayne, did you have any questions or <laughs> I guess the only other question I might have if everyone wanted to sort of in a few sentences just send a, a, a public message or what you would like the public to know not only about Alzheimer's uh, research and, and treatment but just in general um, whether that's words of hope or optimism or we'll get through it or I don't want to put words in your mouth but what I'm seeing here is, is great resilience already. I'm, I'm happy to go. I mean, uh, one of the key messages, research is not going to stop. Research is the key for answering many of the questions that we have. Uh, and we are going to do our best to keep research active. Right now uh, that we are locked down, we are even keeping it active through uh, getting new results and, and publishing new papers. And that will reflect back on all the participants of, of our studies because we let them know, so we make them be part of this. Um, as soon as we are able to come back, we are going to put in place as many safety measures as necessary to be able to keep on going. So I, I will try uh, to give a safe message that uh, we will do it as safe as possible that is for sure and i would like to encourage all our uh, all the research participants around the globe because we have represented a little bit the globe uh, to keep motivated because their their implication is extremely important to tackle disease like alzheimer's and that epidemic is still there we cannot forget that well thank you Phil? Yeah, I think I would agree. I always, I mean, I, a very interesting, very famous virologist in the Netherlands has a history of Alzheimer's disease research. He started as an Alzheimer's researcher and he came back for us five years ago. He said, I'm done with all the viruses. I've done HIV. I've done the influenza, everything. It's so easy. I mean, it's so stupid. I mean, it's just a virus. You just make, you put some RNA and then you make a vaccine. It's done. 
I want to go back to Alzheimer's disease research because that's the real challenge. So I'm keeping to, to I'm saying to people, I mean, this virus, this pandemic, we will we will sort of overcome it. First, the measures, of course, then the vaccine will come. It will come sooner or later. But what remains is the ultimate challenge is the disease that we are all fighting is Alzheimer's disease. And that hasn't disappeared. There is no easy way out. There is no easy remedy. There will not be an easy vaccine even. So we have to fight even harder after we have done this uh, this virus. Thank you. Oscar? Uh, I fully agree. I think uh, this uh, COVID-19 situa uh, situation has um, uh, put some spotlight, at least in Sweden, on nursing homes and the situation of nursing homes. Uh, because as you know, many have, have, have unfortunately died at nursing homes. Uh, but it could in the long end as actually result in something good. Um, the, co the conditions of people working there, the education level and so on, I hope will improve because in Sweden at least that has actually deteriorated in the last tw 10, 20 years. We have a lot of people that are not educated that take care of uh, our elderly people with dementia today. Uh, and now all the politicians at least say that they want to improve this and wish that people taking care of elderly with dementia should, should have that much better education and so on. So maybe there is actually something positive getting out of this uh, in, in that regard. I really hope so. We, we have to remind the politicians, I think, after this crisis about what they said. <laughs> <laughs> because yes. collective memory is very, very short. People forget yes. <laughs> easily. I really want to salute our research participants and our studies teams. Just a very dedicated, inspiring group of people who are hanging in there through this whole process. Actually, I find that older people, uh, our, our participants have done extremely well because most of them are, uh, have a good living situation, they have a good support system, and they're, they're figuring out you know, how to get through this crisis fairly well. So that's, I'm, I'm so happy for that. But we're really looking forward, as you all said, to uh, fighting uh, Alzheimer's full force in a new way. It's not going to be the same. It's, it, this is a transformative experience. Um, and we're going to figure this out, you know, how to do it. But I'm looking forward to getting back so that right now Alzheimer's is uh, not in the forefront, but we know the magnitude of the problem and we're going to get back to it. Uh, and, and we're making a lot of progress and the people, you know, that are on this Zoom call are really part of the, uh, part of the change that, uh, that's happening right now. So it's really exciting, exciting time. Thank you, everyone. Stay safe.